thank you. So uh, my name is Stefan Chenette. I'm a security researcher at WebSense Security Labs. We're based in San Diego. Um, and to give you an idea of my role there, it's always been one that I look at the technology that exists and I try to see the next generation of attacks. So uh, to give you an example, uh, I was part of a research team where we had a host uh, intrusion prevent, uh, prevention system um, looking at in-memory exploitation and that detection of exploits. So my role was trying to create exploits that perhaps didn't follow the general rules and general guidelines and would bypass that type of detection. Um, I worked at uh, an antivirus company where they w were putting and employing certain heuristics for malware. So I would write certain types of malware to try to evade that detection. Um, right now I'm at WebSense and the big thing that we're doing is real-time content analysis. So that's web content going from a malicious web server down to the client, being able to detect that. And so my role is to try to create the perfect scenario. As an attacker, how do I create a malicious website to evade that type of detection? Um, not only gateway detection, but desktop detection as well. So what I'm presenting today is a, an attack I call script fragmentation. Um, and, um, and I want to share some of those details. So the agenda is that we're going to be talking about web exploit delivery, how it currently exists. We're going to be talking about how attackers on a day-to-day -day basis attempt to bypass any detection that's put in place, both on the gateway and on the desktop. And then what we're going to talk about is next generation exploit delivery. One of those techniques is script fragmentation. So again, I'm talking from the perspective of an attacker, but obviously this is a uh, beneficial to everyone, network administrators, users. Um, you'll gain a kind of an understanding of how a lot of software companies are creating the detection you know, and prevention on gateways, on desktops of malicious web content. Um, and how, from my perspective, we're looking at perhaps what we're going to see down the road on a more common basis. So let's talk about exploit delivery and which is a large part of successful web exploitation. So in order to have successful web exploitation, if you have a vulnerable service or application, you know, you, f you found your, your vulnerable service, in order to create an, an exploit for that, that service or application has to be active, has to be accessible, you have to have a, an exploit that's reliable, that's harder um, done than said. You know, heap spraying is, is actually not that reliable. Um, where some of the design bugs are 100% are, are reliable. And then you have to be undetected. I and mean, what does that mean? That means really two things. You have to be undetected if uh, you have a user going and visiting a malicious website um, from that malicious website into the memory of the browser or the memory of the ActiveX controller or whatever uh, process is, is perhaps running. Uh, and then you have to be undetected once you're in memory of actually executing that exploit. So, you know, bypassing any of the common functions that are hooked, common instructions that are kind of uh, referenced. We're going to be talking about the first one, which is how do I get my exploit from point A to point B completely undetected? So a successful evasion really has to do with passing content over the network that is indistinguishable from benign traffic and if it's in, not indistinguishable, it's completely, you're not going to be able to process it. And the gateway or the desktop is going to fail open. It's going to allow it to pass through. So right now, when attackers are creating malicious web pages, malicious websites, there's a lot of currently employed techniques. Um, from the network and, and, and other perspectives, they're always looking as to where those users are coming from. They have a commonly shared blacklist of all the security company network addresses. Um, so they're blacklisting a lot of security companies. They are perhaps just serving that content only once. So if you uh, did have rotating IP range and you were going to check that malicious content um, and you were assuming that it was always going to be there, you might get it the first time, you won't get it the second time. Um, and it, they're even, you know, with, with Storm, for example, you'd go get it and you'd go get it multiple times and then they'd, they'd DDoS you. So there's they have defense mechanisms in place. 
Uh, fast flexing is very commonly used. Um, and they're also verifying that it's a browser going to visit their malicious website. It's not a crawler. There's thousands of ways to tell the difference between a crawler, um, not only like a, a Google crawler, but actually most security companies have a crawler that they've built in-house uh, going to visit all these malicious web pages, pulling down the con and content and to determine what, what's, what's happening. So they're differentiating between a real browser and that particular crawler. But most importantly for the content, they're obfuscating the content. They've moved one step past that. They're using polymorphic obfuscation. And in the last year or two, they've, they've more and more used encryption um, with this, with, within various parts of, of the content being passed down. But still, they're really in kind of an old school mentality. And when, when attackers are making use of the web in general, uh, from a content perspective, they're really in a web 1.0 world. And let's talk about what that means. So there's kind of a shift in mentality that needs to happen within a lot of people who are looking at protection on the web. Common scenario, get HTTP OK. So when I go and fetch a page, let's assume that it doesn't have a lot of other images, a lot of objects within that page. It's kind of a get and then a response. Web 1.0 world, it's synchronous. Click, submit. If we all remember kind of, you know, before kind of uh, a lot of the more mashups and everything, you'd go to a form, you'd fill in all the information, you'd hit submit. What would happen? You would wait forever and ever and ever. It was processing on the server. Finally, something would come back, but it was really synchronous. Um, it's not really how it is today. Web 1.0 world, from a the perspective of a lot of security companies is still kind of how they're viewing things. Do a get, get the response, what happens? The response comes back in its complete 100% uh, of, of the content comes back all at once. And in most cases, if it's a gateway looking at it, it's going to inspect it in line, somewhere along the line, and it's going to have a lot of content to look at. It's easily going to see that, for example, this is a, one of the VML exploits. Um, it's easily going to tell there's certain keywords, shell code. You know, this is everyday kind of signature detection. It's easily going to tell that there's a simple NOP sled, 9090s at the beginning. It's going to be able to tell that there's a use of a heap address um, within that unescape. So there's things that are just going to trigger automatically. I mean, bells and whistles are going to go off like crazy. This is obviously malicious from any of the most simple uh, signature analysis engines. And from the desktop perspective, well, most desktop AVs are looking at the cached file on disk. Um, they're also looking at the network, like the gateway is doing, but they're also looking at the cached file on disk. And so that exists normally in the C document settings, whatever your username is, local settings, temporary internet files. That pops on a disk, hits disk. They're going to use their, their common AV engine to uh, to match one of thousands of other signatures, the same way a gateway is going to do it to determine if it's malicious. So it's one, con you know, one step content transfer. Look at this big blob of text. I have more than enough from a defense standpoint to determine if it's malicious or not. So what did attackers do? Next step, so they started using obfuscation, polymorphic obfuscation. Um, every single time a user would come to visit that site, not only would they be fed a content that was completely obfuscated, scrambled, um, difficult for a signature uh, detection engine or a simple signature detection engine to process, um, they started using polymorphic obfuscation. It would be completely dynamically generated when that user would go to the site just for them. If you've never looked, because I can't assume that everybody um, loves to look at malicious content all day long, this is what it commonly looks like. You know, it's completely scrambled code. This is what's going to be fed from that malicious server to the user. You know, you can't make much of this. The, uh, you know, the characters, uh, the, the variable names are obviously um, a little bit higher entropy, for example. Um, white space, uh, for the most part, is removed. Um, what we're looking at here is a simple substitution cipher. So they've created some string. It's got a long text um, of, of, you know, some type of rotated character. It's going to be fed through, you know, an algorithm, and it's going to make sense on the other end. Most likely, eval will be called, and then uh, it'll be processed.